waiting to see which side to join. Forget liberal ideals and high principles. The question was, who would offer them the most? And who would win this war? These smaller nations, Italy, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, also had scores to settle, lands they wanted back. The price of any alliance would be high. Marie, Queen of Romania, at her post-war coronation. British-born as Princess of Edinburgh, Marie had effectively led Romania as Britain's loyal ally in the First World War. She kneels before her husband, King Ferdinand. But behind closed doors, Marie called the shots. She was instrumental in brokering the critical deal. Marie had written to the Russian Tsar, cousin Nicky, and to the British King, cousin George, putting Romania's entry in the First World War out to tender. Being neutral, I get news from all sides. Each tries to persuade us that defeat for them is impossible. Promises and threats being dangled over our heads. The Romanian government, prodded by Marie, fixed the price for entry on the Allied side. Transylvania, the Banat and Bukovina. She added for George V's benefit, These geographical explanations must be Chinese to you, but the places can be found on a map. Her Prussian-born husband Ferdinand rather fancied joining Germany, but by August 1916, the Allies agreed Romania's terms in full. In Rome, Italy's leaders had already cashed in. Instead of joining the Central Powers, in line with pre-war treaties, Italy initially declared neutrality. But in October 1914, Prime Minister Salandra said Italy must act for her own national good. He called this policy sacro egoismo, sacred self-interest. In practice, it meant joining the side of the highest bidder. Few Italians wanted to fight. But the Allies offered a chunk of Austria-Hungary, part of the Dalmatian coast, and threw in a few islands. So without consulting Parliament, Salandra accepted, landing his people with one of the harshest fronts in the entire war. Italy's border with Austria-Hungary zigzagged for 375 miles into Europe's highest peaks. The Austro-Hungarians had the advantage, holding the high ground along the entire front. It was brutal terrain. Italian Alpine troops inch up to the front line. An officer beats out a rhythm for men hauling a field gun up the slope.
In May 1915, Italian troops seized the mountain village of Cortina d'Ampezzo. In front of them, the vast Lagazzuoi mountain. By sunrise, the Italians had climbed its sheer rock face to a narrow ledge. They were now fighting a vertical war. Above them, the Austro-Hungarians had fewer men, but showed a tenacity they lacked elsewhere. Austrian Colonel Victor Schemfel watched his men attack the Italians below. They threw several hand grenades on the ridge, which was about 100 meters below them. Judging by the screams of the wounded, and from the fact that the machine gun hasn't fired a single shot all day, we must have been successful. But the Italians clung on, two miles above sea level. Each side burrowed into the mountains and spent the next two years trying to dislodge the other. Fifteen men slept in this cave carved out of the rock. Both sides worked 24-hour shifts, digging tunnels, trying to reach the enemy's position and blast the mountain under them. Some went mad listening for the sound of enemy drills. My nerves are shot to pieces. I've got to calm down. I've now been in the front line four months amid constant fear and torment. Avalanches became another hazard of war, sometimes triggered by shell fire. Austrian Eugenie Omich was caught in one that wiped out nine barrack huts, killing 272. I stayed squashed under the debris of the beds. For the first quarter of an hour, I could feel 50 or so men moving around me, and then one by one, they fell silent and died. Italy's frontier with Austria-Hungary leveled out along the Isonzo River. Italy's first attack failed with heavy loss of life. But General Luigi Cadorna bloody-mindedly ordered another and another. Eleven battles in all, at a cost of 300,000 lives. They never reached their main objective, the port of Trieste. Giuseppe Cordano served in the Julian Alps in a trench system just 15 meters below the Austrian positions. Between the two trenches, it's a cataclysm. The dead are scattered everywhere, half buried. Haversacks, rifles, rags of clothing, and human body parts. A couple of grenades fall in the middle of the dike where some soldiers are sheltering, and everything is thrown up in the air. Rocks fly and fall with furious destruction. Laments and screams for help can be heard from everywhere, but how can one move? How can one help them? No! 
I'm astride the crest, and I carry on, meter by meter, ducking my head under shrapnel fire. Ten meters in front of me, Zanni from Vicenza is hit in the head, screams, and falls down the precipice. I watch his body tumbling down. He was a good lad. I keep going, forever asking myself when my time will come. In the winter of 1914, Germany's high command told the Kaiser they decided to launch the major offensive of 1915 against the Russians. The generals ruled out total victory, but a decisive blow might force the Russians to sue for peace. Germany moved eight divisions from the Western Front to the Eastern to try to break through the Russians at Gorlitzer in the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains. Now German fought alongside Austrian. Austrian Matthias Migschitz sensed the change of mood. It sounds wonderful to hear German troops speaking. Everyone is sure of victory, conscious of their might. You hear no melancholy talk, no bleak forecasts. Florence Farnborough, a British nurse with the Russian Red Cross, travelled with her camera along the Eastern Front. Her nursing team went by horse cart to Gorlitzer. They had no idea a third of a million Germans and Austrians were massing to attack the town. We have already chosen our hospital. It is a well-built house with several nice airy rooms. We are surrounded by the Carpathians. I love watching them at night when the mountains lie mysteriously quiet and passive. to arrive. They came in their hundreds from all directions, some able to walk, others crawling, dragging themselves along the ground. As the Germans got near, Florence's team was ordered to evacuate. And the wounded? They shouted to us when they saw us leaving called out to us in piteous language to stop. We had to wrench our skirts from their clinging hands. Caught by surprise and low on shells, the Russians retreated. Infantryman Miaskovsky wrote to his friend, the composer Sergei Prokofiev. My dearest Seriorzhenka, we're in a state of unstoppable panicked retreat. Our troops are melting away like snow. Only six to seven hundred survived out of a 3,000 strong regiment in one day alone. The Russian army fled, but not towards the negotiating table. They scorched the earth. Vasily Mishnin retreated through the village of Dombrovo. The locals received us well, but in the evening, when the Cossacks arrived and began to drive them out with cruelty, then there were tears and grief and cursing of the war. The Russians were looking for scapegoats, and the Jews of Eastern Europe fitted the bill. They didn't look Russian, and their language, Yiddish, sounded suspiciously like German. 